happening right now. We're doing this without the medical evidence, without the testing that the governor was calling for. He spoke out against medical marijuana in New York State. Senator John D. Francisco was outnumbered as lawmakers overwhelmingly approved it late today. We'll take you to the Senate floor with a look at how the debate went down. And the, the secret school meeting one week ago at a highly charged Syracuse school board meeting. Teachers voted no confidence in the superintendent. Today, the key players involved sat down at the table. So what's next for the head of Syracuse schools? Also arson. Tonight, we learned the cause of a fire on Butternut Street. Two days ago, a Syracuse police re released dramatic surveillance video of the crime at a late day press conference. And it's a scary situation. What could happen to any parent? Children left in the car, they die from the heat. Tonight, tips from health experts to keep your kids safe this summer. From CNY Central, this is NBC3 News at 5. Good evening. Welcome to NBC 3 News at 5. I'm Matt Mulcahy. And I'm Megan Coleman. A lot to get to. And we begin with breaking news out of Ithaca tonight. Just into our newsroom minutes ago, a tractor trailer crashing into a restaurant on the Ithaca Commons around 4 o'clock this afternoon. The breaking news coming in within the last hour. This tractor trailer crashed into Simeon's restaurant on the Commons. It happened just after 4 o'clock this afternoon. The truck went inside the restaurant at the end of the Common and South Aurora Street. You can see on the right side of your screen there is East State Street. There's a big hill that comes down from the Cornell side of town into the campus or into the Commons area. The area where you see that blue dot there, number one, that's the section we're talking about here where Simeon's restaurant is. Now the mayor's office, I just got off with the phone with them moments ago. They say they are expecting multiple injuries. There's concern about that. They say so far no reports of any fatalities. They have also put out a traffic alert for that area saying they want people who are in the Ithaca area tonight don't drive around that end of the commons. Please keep it clear for emergency vehicles as they have a lot of work to do in a building that may be unstable. We're going to continue to follow this story including getting reports from the scene as soon as we get information throughout the next hour and a half. Also, more breaking news tonight, this time from Syracuse, a fire that left a woman in Syracuse critically hurt. Syracuse police just wrapped up a news conference about an hour ago. The fire broke out on Butternut Street on Syracuse's north side in the early morning hours of Wednesday. Yeah, they arrested a man here who has a history of arson. Firefighters pulled the woman from the building. She was conscious when she was rushed to Upstate Hospital for treatment. Officials say the fire was started on the back porch of the house. Just two hours ago, fire investigators released this dramatic surveillance video which they say shows Patrick Kelly walking by the house and setting it on fire. It is remarkable what this video captured of the house literally going up in flames. Our Alex Dunbar just finished talking to police. He's live from the scene of the fire tonight with a new example of those anti-crime cameras doing a good job. Alex. Well, Megan, take a look. Investigators say this is where the fire started in those early morning hours on Wednesday on the porch here at 931 Butternut Street. This morning, police and fire investigators arrested 56-year-old Patrick Kelly. What was the break that led them to Kelly? Well, hold on, we're going to show you right here, right across the street, a Syracuse police surveillance camera, and up the block is another one. Police showed us the surveillance footage about an hour and a half ago. You see someone walk up and throw a burning object onto the porch here at 931 Butternut Street and then walk away. Within a few minutes, the house is engulfed in flames. Firefighters rescued a woman who lived here. She is still in critical condition. Patrick Kelly is charged with arson in the first degree. He has three other arson arrests dating back to 1973 on Syracuse. Police and fire investigators say the surveillance footage from the crime cameras was instrumental and also exonerated two young men who walked by shortly after the fire started. Initially, witnesses believed that those two young men were involved. Based on what the, the um, uh, witness saw, we would look we would probably look at them as 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 a potential suspect in this and this would we would spend a, a great deal of time on these young people and and they would have been subject to a, an interrogation that was unwarranted 
And the footage we just showed you is actually from a surveillance camera up the street. As we showed you, there is a police surveillance camera right across the street. They have footage from that. Police declined to share that footage today, citing the fact there could be a prosecution in the case. That would be evidence. For now, reporting from Butternut Street on the north side of Syracuse, I'm Alex Dunbar. Wow. Those, those cameras really did the job finding the person who started this here. Thank you, Alex. We have new information tonight on Oswego County's most notorious sex offender. The state attorney general's office may be looking into whether serial sex offender Ray Yunus should be confined to a secure psychiatric facility upon his release from prison. As we were first to report to you, Yunus is due to be released next month after serving 16 years in prison for sexually abusing 17 boys. Over the last week, we have pressed for more answers and learned the Office of Mental Health is now conducting an evaluation on Yunus. Based on that recommendation, the attorney general would have the option of taking Eunice to court to have him committed to a secure facility for an indefinite period of time. Tonight, we have very few answers about what's next in the ongoing saga surrounding Syracuse Superintendent Sharon Contreras. Today, she sat down face to face with the mayor, the union president, school board members and others to talk about the recent backlash against her. <laughs> This was the scene one week ago at a Syracuse school board meeting. Many teachers gathered as the head of the Syracuse Teachers Association announced a no confidence vote in the superintendent, with 95% of teachers saying they've lost confidence in Contreras' ability to handle issues in the district. So what exactly happened at today's meeting? Well, in a statement, the mayor told us, quote, this morning I met with Superintendent Sharon Contreras, STA President Kevin Ahern, and several members of the Board of Education to discuss their ongoing concerns in our schools. We had a wide-ranging discussion. It was productive and we agreed to continue these discussions. I did reach out to the mayor today as well as the union and the superintendent. Also every school board member. No one could give me any information about what was discussed or what will happen next. Well, we enjoyed another nice day in the weather. Comfortable temperatures, light breeze out there. Uh, last uh, taste of spring in central New York. Oh, looks nice out there tonight. Meteorologist Mike Brookins is in for Wayne on the weather deck for us. Mike? Megan and Matt, tomorrow at 6.51 in the morning, we bring in summer. And I think over the weekend, we get a summery feel returning. But right now, it feels delightful. We've got a lack of humidity. Temperatures just a little bit below average. A nice breeze, as Matt mentioned. And look at that. There's the Staley Lost Sky Watch. A good amount of hazy sunshine. We'll call it that. A veil of high, thin clouds streaming in, but it's still letting a lot of sun on through. There's our Adirondack Furniture camera. Live triple Doppler radar, nice and dry. It will stay this way. I think most of the weekend. It's going to look good. 71, our temperature. We'll be just tracking these numbers going down for tonight. It will turn cool by late at night. We'll find a variably cloudy sky for this evening. At times partly cloudy, other times mostly cloudy with just some high thin clouds. Looks like we'll stay rain free here. Just a light breeze diminishing, becoming nearly calm. And that's going to allow the temperature to fall quickly once the sun goes down. Notice that drop into the 60s and 50s and in some spots 40s later on tonight. Maybe this is a little too cool to do some swimming. We'll let you know when we could come back close to 90 in my seven day forecast. Back inside. All right, Mike, thank you. Well, tonight, medical marijuana is one step closer to becoming a reality here in New York. Today, the state, state Senate passed a bill to legalize the use of, mar of marijuana for medicinal purposes by a vote of 49 to 10. The drug will be used to help severely ill patients deal with pain and other symptoms. Now, this decision makes New York the 23rd state to legalize the drug, but it will not be available for at least 18 months as regulations and policies still need to be established. New at 5 tonight, our George Scheidel takes us inside the debate with lo local law lawmakers and a look at what happened on the floor of the state senate today. Eyes 49, nays 10. The bill is passed. In a marathon session where discussion lasted more than four hours, only 10 senators voted against the Compassionate Care Act. One of them was Syracuse Republican John DeFrancisco. We're doing this without the medical evidence, without the testing that the governor was calling for in the beginning of the year that the medical society is calling for. We're gonna do it first and then kind of figure it out as we go along. But others, like long-term Senator William Larkin, who represents parts of Orange, Rockland, and Ulster counties, say the 18-month period before enacting will give medical professionals plenty of time to do more testing. We've got a 19-month, 18-month stretch here that we can look deep into some of these specifics. But Senator DeFrancisco argues in the meantime, we're opening the addiction door. I know most are saying that medical marijuana or med marijuana is not addictive. Well, 
The people that I've talked to say it is. While other senators, like Liz Krueger, who represents part of New York County, says the research says otherwise. The research has been done enough to show us that marijuana is far less dangerous a drug to use for these illnesses than most of the drugs that are legally prescribed. And that passing this bill could end suffering. There's an old saying in the army, leader, get the hell out of the way, and I apologize to the ladies in the room. <laughs> but there's an issue. We have a crisis, whether you want to believe it or not. 21 other states have looked at it and said, let's do something. And now New York joins the pack as the 22nd state to legalize medical marijuana. Reporting from Syracuse, I'm Dora Scheidel. So what do you think about the debate over medical marijuana? Join the conversation on our CMY Central Facebook page. We'll share some of your comments in our talk tonight. That's coming up at 530. Could be a simple mistake that could lead to deadly results. Leaving your children in the car it could happen to almost any parent. And this year alone, there have already been several deaths. Coming up, we'll have expert tips on how to protect your children from this dangerous situation. And are you working less and sleeping more? Then you're not alone. Two specific factors are behind this trend. And it's a case that made it all the way to the nation's highest court. What kind of prayers will open a town board meeting in a town near Rochester? Let's head out to the weather deck now for a check on the forecast. It is Friday, of course, so we are inching closer to that weekend. Yeah, it's a ride for most people, <laughs> I gotta say. Mike, what's the latest? Yeah, that's most people. Uh, I'll be working uh, at least tomorrow. Matt and Megan, you guys, you, you, Monday through Friday, people, we've had four weekends now of nice weather. This is gonna be number five, so some pretty good timing. Yeah, during the week, we get these showers and storms, and then things dry on out. And it is beautiful out here this evening, definitely dry. Let's show you the Stanley Law Sky Watch. We've got some hazy sunshine, we'll put it that way, a high, thin veil of clouds, but we're looking good, nice and dry. That does not show you how low the humidity is and how nice the air feels with the breeze right now. Winds are out of the northwest at 10 miles per hour and our temperatures in the lower 70s at 71. So far, I've only seen a high temperature of about 72 and normal high temperatures closer to 80 at 79. But look at that dew point temperature, 47, giving us a 42% relative humidity. And I think the weekend's going to continue on this very comfortable note. We will see some cool temperatures later on tonight. I mean, you look where we are here at 5 o'clock, not too warm. Uh, a little bit nippy, cool to be doing some swimming. 71 in Syracuse at 68 in Fulton. A little bit warmer in Elmira, but it falls to closer to 60 up in the Saranac Lake. On the other side of a the front, there is some warmth down here in Washington over towards Chicago, well into the 80s. Along that front, moisture is sliding from northwest to southeast, and eventually that front's going to come into play here probably not until after the weekend. So we're looking good, just some high thin clouds trying to work in. We've got an area of high pressure just up to our northwest. It's sinking dry air. So the thick clouds over Michigan, the rain showers just fizzle out as they come this way. The clouds shear apart and we get those wispy high thin cirrus clouds across central New York. And they probably won't keep the uh, temperature up tonight. Not thick enough to do that, but you can see that bank of clouds and showers. And these showers are getting awfully close to New York State. So I'm looking at the latest computer model guidance and it's taking this precipitation down towards Jamestown and then Williamsport. We will at times get some thicker cloud cover, so partly to mostly cloudy for tonight. Most of it just high thin clouds. Here's our future cast. We should stay dry. That chance for rain southwestern New York going into Pennsylvania. Cool start with some patchy light valley fog again tonight. As we go through the day tomorrow, nice day with sun and clouds. More in the way of sunshine for Sunday with warming temperatures. So this evening, winds die off. Temperatures go down with that variably cloudy sky. Overnight low temperature down to 50, a little valley fog. As we start the day, sunshine and clouds are partly sunny. The brightest portion of the day towards the evening when we turn mostly sunny. 77 for tomorrow and that low humidity sticks around for Sunday, we're up close to 80 degrees. Sunshine with some patchy afternoon and midday clouds and a light breeze. 85 on Monday, still low humidity, though that comes back towards Monday evening when we could find an isolated shower or storm. A few showers and storms, especially late on Tuesday, nearly 90 at 89. Lots of humidity, then scattered showers and storms on Wednesday. Matt and Megan.
All right, Mike, thank you so much. Well, to the story now of a two-year-old boy from Hastings as he continues his battle against leukemia. We first introduced you to Paul Morley back in October. On day 29 of his treatment, he tested positive for a residual disease which could cause a relapse. Since then, the Morley family has compiled a bucket list for Paul of all the experiences they want him to have, and now there is a benefit being held in his honor. The event will be held at JPS Bar and Grill on Route 11 in Hastings this Sunday from 1 to 6 p.m. All of the proceeds will benefit Paul Morley and his family. The conflict in Iraq can already be felt here in the U.S. Americans are now paying the highest June gas prices in six years, mostly due to the fear that the ISIS group will cut off oil exports. Steve Handelsman reports how motorists are reacting to the rising prices as this adds more fuel to the debate. It's a ricochet from Iraq to the gas pumps of America. Prices that normally drop 20 cents in June are not. One minute they climb it fast, the next minute they climb it slow, but they climb. That cuts into Raymond Green's profits at his limo company and costs all U.S. drivers. I mean, the gas is important. It's killing me. Experts blame in part the radical Islamic fighters of ISIS who are targeting Iraq's wells, refineries, and cities. There's a real fear that the rebels may take Baghdad or the southern oil producing areas in Iraq. And that in turn is driving up the cost of oil and making it more expensive for refineries to produce gasoline. Secretary of State Kerry is heading to Iraq, where the nation's top Shiite religious leader today warned Prime Minister Maliki to put more Sunnis in his government. President Obama is sending 300 advisors, but not right away and not to fight. This is not a combat mission. That's just the way it is. It is not a combat mission. The U.S. might never launch airstrikes because of the Obama goal. Not re-engage in the Iraqi civil war. And that makes Raymond Green happy. For all the lives lost, for everything that's going on, to me it don't seem like a, a lot got accomplished, but the gas went up. So far, that's a pricey annoyance. I'm Steve Handels, NBC News, Washington. Over two million teens visit a tanning salon each year, but tanning has been linked to skin cancer known as melanoma. But even if your kids know the dangers of tanning beds, why do some of them keep going back? Coming up, can you actually get addicted to tanning? We'll have the surprising answer for you in tonight's health checkup. And coming up at 5.30, we'll tell you about a new rule that will allow same-sex couples to qualify for benefits even if the state does not recognize same-sex marriage. You're watching NBC3 News at 5. We are back now with the latest in the breaking news we first told you about at the top of the hour about a tractor trailer crash uh, just after four o'clock today in Ithaca. This happened at the Ithaca Commons. A tractor trailer coming down the hill apparently crashed into Simeon's restaurant there on the Ithaca Commons. We do know the truck went inside the restaurant at the end of the Common and South Aurora Street. The Ithaca Voice is a digital online a news source in the community of Ithaca. They're saying right now on Twitter, police on the scene, at least three people have been sent to the hospital, uh, that a man was just crying running towards Simeon's, ignoring the police tape, shouting and swearing. They also go on to describe how people responded just after this took place, that they were smashing out windows of Simeon's with the brick, again, the Ithaca voice on its Twitter feed, uh, showing that some people were rushing in to help with fire extinguishers, uh, implying that there was some fire, at least initially after the crash took place. People were crawling out of windows. We immediately broke the window so people could come out, said one witness on the scene. And here's one picture from the Ithaca voice that they posted uh, about uh, well, almost 45 minutes ago now or so. As you see, it was a tractor trailer carrying all those trucks and cars that smashed into that familiar corner of the commons where Simeon's has been for many, many years. Our Alex Rosillo and photographer Quindell Williams are headed to the scene right now to gather new information and bring us some live pictures here. We can tell you the Ithaca Journal is reporting that uh, fire officials there are on the scene. They have been inside the restaurant, perhaps trying to free the driver and any others who were hurt. We do know that medical helicopters have been called to the scene with multiple injuries reported. There is also concern uh, about that building, which apparently was uh, partially leaning after the crash, and it's reportedly unstable. Certainly many, many emergency crews on the scene there uh, working to free anyone who's trapped, bring the injured to the hospital, uh, and maintain the scene there, again, with that building being unstable. Yeah, so once again, we'll follow this information. We have a crew on the way. Serious situation in Ithaca right now at one of their most familiar corners on the comments. The latest on that coming up at 530. First, though, let's get to your health checkup tonight. 
Americans seem to be working less and sleeping more. Researchers say the recession and the growing baby boomer population who are retiring in record numbers are contributing to the findings. They looked at more than 11,000 Americans and found they slept eight hours and 44 minutes each day. Most performed work related tasks for about three hours a day. But when researchers looked at those employed, that number jumped to seven and a half hours. Is it possible be, to be addicted to tanning? Well, a new mod medical study suggests it might be. Researchers at Massachusetts General exposed mice to a daily dose of UV radiation for six weeks. After a week of exposure, researchers found elevated levels of endorphins in mice. Those are considered feel-good hormones that have a similar impact to heroin. The endorphin levels in the mice after just one week were high enough to mask their sensation of pain. Once the trial ended, the mice were given a drug to block endorphins, and they experienced symptoms of withdrawal. Already this summer, more than a dozen kids have died after being left inside hot cars. Even in 80 degree weather, the inside of a car can quickly get up to 120 degrees. And tonight, we hear from one father who is dealing with the guilt and pain of losing his young daughter after leaving her asleep in the back seat. Jay Gray reports. As temperatures continue to climb, so does a deadly trend. She's been in the car for hours. I, I absolutely forgot about her. Already this spring, kids have been left in hot cars in South Carolina, Sarasota, and Orlando, Florida, Texas, Augusta, and Atlanta, Georgia, where a father's been charged with murder after leaving his 22-month-old son in the back seat for seven hours. In temperatures like we have this week, 90 degrees plus, it takes really only minutes to get the car, the temperature in the car up to a dangerous level. 13 children have died in hot cars already this spring. Since 1998, more than 720 kids have died after being left in hot vehicles. That's an average of 38 each year. It's puzzling how, how someone could forget that they, they have a child in the back seat. Richie Gray knows the pain of such a horrible mistake. It's an unimaginable loss. Gray forgot his young daughter was asleep in the back of his car last month and warns other parents. It's so easy for the child to go to sleep, you know, and, and you not realize that, you know, they're still in there because your, your brain is on autopilot. Until it's too late. Jay Gray, NBC News. Well, it was a bill that resulted from one of the most horrifying crimes in recent memory. So why did it die in the state assembly? Well, headed six, Jim Kenyon shows us why prosecutors say the battle is not over yet to change some laws in family courts. Welcome back, TGIF, on this Friday evening. I'm meteorologist Mike Brookins, and as we head through this weekend, we've got some fantastic news once again. It may be a close call with the system out to the west, so stay tuned to the forecast, but I do think it's just going to brush us with some cloud cover. We did see temperatures a little bit below average for today. Normal high temperature is closer to 80. We're closer to 70, 72. So far, our high temperature, it was only in the 60s up in Fulton, 68, 64 today in Saranac Lake. And the warm spot down towards Dansville, Elmira, both at 73 degrees. Well, our temperatures are just about at the highs for the day. We're one degree cooler at 71 with a mixture of sunshine and high thin clouds. No precipitation, as you can see on live triple Doppler radar. That'll stay that way. We may see some showers come in towards Jamestown later tonight uh, after midnight and then down into north central Pennsylvania for a while tonight before that system moves away. And that will wait until late Monday before our next chance for rain as a cold front finally comes back up. But looks like high pressure up to our north is going to control our our weather. So it's status quo, just a gradual warming trend this weekend. We'll be in and out of those high clouds from the system out to the west tonight and tomorrow. So a variably cloudy sky at 8 o'clock. The winds dying down. Humidity levels low. Ah, it feels great this evening. 67 degrees will eventually get down to a cool level at 50. Looking at our Saturday forecast, uh, partly sunny to a mix of sun and clouds towards the evening. Skies start to brighten a little bit more as the system finally pulls away, and that'll give us a brighter, I think, second half to the weekend. Tomorrow's temperatures 77 degrees with low humidity. Tough to beat, but maybe we do just that on Sunday with a mostly sunny sky, then a few clouds mixing in during the midday and afternoon. Temperatures up to about 80 degrees will have still low humidity. Enjoy because we've got the heat and humidity coming back next week. Monday 85, there is a risk for a shower or storm late day to the west of Syracuse. A better chance on Tuesday when the temperature gets quite steamy. 
It'll feel like it's well into the 90s with that higher dew point temperature at 89 for our official high. A few showers and storms Tuesday, especially late and Wednesday, some scattered showers and storms. By then we might need it. Have a great weekend. Back inside, guys. Right now, the White House is looking to expand the rights of same-sex couples in states where their marriage is recognized. One year since the Defense of Marriage Act was struck down, how far we've come and what else is in store? Plus. When I was walking by, I just happened to glance up and I seen the scaffolding on an angle. And uh, one guy to the left of the scaffold was just hanging by his harness. Scaffolding breaks on a 20-foot tall building in New York City. The eyewitness account and how those who were on it are now doing. And if you're just joining us, we continue to follow breaking news out of Ithaca tonight. A tractor trailer slammed into the popular restaurant Simeon's right on the commons in Ithaca late today. That's right. It happened within the last hour and a half. We're getting reports the building may be unstable and we are getting word reports of multiple injuries. We'll continue to follow the story for the next hour and on through the evening tonight. But first, new at 5.30, one year after the Supreme Court struck down the, De the Defense of Marriage Act, the White House is expanding the rights of same-sex couples. Married, gay, and lesbian Americans will now be allowed to take leave from work to care for a sick spouse, regardless of where they live. Tonight, Danielle Lee is following the story from Washington. I love you, Bucky. Around the country, an increasing number of same-sex couples are legally saying their vows. 20 years ago, I didn't expect that this would happen in my lifetime, and it's the most wonderful thing in the world. 19 states now allow same-sex marriage, and this year alone, federal judges have declared gay marriage bans unconstitutional in eight states. Now, the Obama administration is expanding the rights of those couples, allowing them to take leave from work when a spouse is sick, be buried in a national cemetery next to their veteran spouse, collect survivor benefits through the Social Security Administration, and for federal contractors barring discrimination based on sexual orientation. Attorney Sarah Warbolo represents the LGBT community. It's actually a huge deal for same-sex couples um, who are living in states that don't recognize their marriages. The changes are outraging conservative groups who rallied in Washington this week, vowing to reclaim the definition of marriage. This is about loving truth and loving what's best for men, women, and children. At a recent Democratic fundraiser, President Obama spoke to members of the LGBT community. Stigma and fear have no place in our laws. He's promising to fight for equality on behalf of same-sex couples. In Washington, I'm Danielle Lee, NBC News. Right now, there are several bills pending in Congress that would further expand rights to same-sex couples. We continue to follow breaking news out of Ithaca tonight. A tractor trailer crashed into Simeon's restaurant on the Ithaca Commons. It happened just after 4 o'clock this afternoon. Now, the truck was actually pushed inside the restaurant at the end of the Commons near South Aurora Street and State Street. The Ithaca Journal reports the building is unstable. We've heard from Ithaca City Hall that there are multiple injuries. And here's a picture coming to us from the Ithaca Voice, a digital news source in the Ithaca community. Uh, to give you a sense of where this is, Simmons is on the Ithaca Commons at State and Aurora Streets. Police say it could be sometime as long as 12 hours before this area is reopened. But again, if you're just now joining us, just getting home tonight, the breaking news out of Ithaca tonight, a tractor trailer has slammed into a restaurant, Simeon's restaurant, on the Ithaca Commons. There's no word at this point how many people were in the restaurant at the time, uh, but Ithaca City Hall is confirming for us tonight. There are multiple injuries, no word yet on any fatalities. We do know medical helicopters have been called to the scene to transport patients tonight. And we also know people are rushing to the scene now concerned that loved ones may have been injured or inside that restaurant. A very emotional time in Ithaca. We'll stay with the story. And we'll continue to follow this for you on air and online throughout the next hour and through the evening. You can stay up to date by downloading our mobile app as well. We will push out any new information we get into our newsroom tonight. It is time now for the latest news around the state in your New York Minute. We've been following this story for you for months and new tonight. We've learned an atheist will deliver the opening prayer at the next meeting in the western New York town of Greece, around which a recent United States Supreme Court prayer case was centered. The Center for Inquiry says Dan Courtney will open the July 15th board meeting. You'll remember plaintiffs were uncomfortable with the idea that mostly Christian prayers were spoken. The Supreme Court ruled the prayers were in line with longstanding national traditions. Courtney says his invocation will focus on the theme of inclusion in America. Also new tonight, two men dangling from a broken scaffold are shaken up, but they're otherwise okay. 
happened between the 12th and 13th floors of a 20-story building in New York City. One man climbed to safety. Police officers helped the other two who were trapped. People stopped to watch the dramatic rescue as it unfolded. One guy to the left of the scaffold was just hanging by his harness. The other guy was on the top of the scaffold, standing on it. Police officers secured them using their harnesses and brought them to safety through a window to bring them inside. A group of Long Island neighbors are blowing the whistle on Huntington town leaders to limit the use of gas-powered leaf blowers. They're called CALM, Citizens Appeal for Leaf Blower Moderation. The group says the emissions from the machines cause asthma and other respiratory illnesses, so they're asking the town to use rakes and brooms instead. CALM has collected 400 signatures for the cause and have support from the American Lung Association and other environmental and medical organizations. But the Nassau Suffolk Landscape Gardeners Association says the blowers are needed to effectively clear properties and says industry professionals can prove they do not steer up the dust. Coming up our talk tonight as we continue to follow the historic legislation that allowed the use of medical marijuana in New York State. The Pope is now weighing in. Why he thinks legalizing recreational drugs is not the best idea. We'll look at his solution. <laughs> Then it's been more than a week since 95% of voters in the Syracuse Teachers Association said they have no confidence in the superintendent's, uh, uh, superintendent's ability to lead. Now there is a conversation to move forward. We'll talk about the progress in a moment. Remember, you're always invited to join our conversation. The hashtag with TalkCNY on Twitter. Welcome back to the talk tonight. Pope Francis is taking a stand against the legalization of drugs. At a drug enforcement conference, he called a drug addiction an evil and said you can't compromise with the devil. Pontiff said even limited steps toward legalizing recreational drugs are questionable from a legislative standpoint and fail to produce the desired effect. He says the problem that people have can't be solved with drugs. So the Pope's comments coming on the same day that New York State approves the use of medical marijuana in the future for this state, joining uh, 21 or 22 other states across the country with that uh, step forward in legalizing marijuana in our country. And it's com completely a coincidence that the Pope happened to be talking about that on the same day. He obviously is not planning his schedule based around the New York State legislature, but it is an interesting confluence to have a pope who, um, in many respects, has been considered this more socially liberal for a pope, mm. uh, religious leader, making these comments globally today. Although I don't think anyone would be surprised by what no. the pope said today. I think that uh, it would certainly be a headline if the pope came out and advocated for the use of marijuana, even yes. on a, a medicinal basis. But, but you're right, it sort of is ironic that we're hearing from the pope on the day that uh, state lawmakers here in New York were talking about this and, and making medical marijuana legal here in New York State. One thing that's worth noting when, it, when the pope does speak, that whether he's speaking toward the global church or just the world itself, uh, he does have that wide reach of, of adjusting um, political debate, which certainly the marijuana issue has been a political debate, and not just in our country, but in other countries too, in South America and other places where there have been discussions about legalizing marijuana, not just for medicinal purposes. So it's important to keep in mind that although he obviously is by title uh, a religious leader, he is also a cultural and political figure that does have influence around the world. And it could I, sway some opinions here and there. I, you know, I really think that when it comes to issues like this, people are looking for voices. They're looking for voices and leaders and people with insight and perspective uh, because we don't all know the answers to everything and, and maybe research down the line might change our opinion on something. You know, even State Senator John DeFrancisco, who was on the floor today, um, he was advocating against the passage of medical marijuana here in New York, he said, listen, um, you know, all the experts at this point say we need to do more research. We need to know more about the effects and and uh, before I'm able to, to sort of get on board with something like this. But at this point, all the medical experts that I've talked to have said we need more time. Yeah, and we've had a few of those on the air, too, that have said that in some of the stories that we've done that, that it's not the best idea to start legalizing marijuana on the recreational basis, certainly relative to the medical side. It is interesting to note, though, as you mentioned, Senator DeFrancisco, 
Cisco at this time yesterday, we were talking about the governor's deal, that it was a done deal, that it was going to be voted on last night. And then, you know, the wee hours of the morning came along and uh, people in Albany who are used to staying up late at night this time of year, uh, they decided in the Senate side, let's let's take a break. Let's get up again the next day and talk about it some more. And, and we didn't hear much about the political opposition to it until we heard from Senator DeFrancisco talking about it today. And there were uh, 10 others, including Senator Patty Ritchie from the North Country, who voted against this idea. So it wasn't a unanimous vote that everybody thought moving forward on medical marijuana was the right thing to do at this time. No, but they were certainly outnumbered. The majority uh, of senators today supported uh, making medical marijuana here uh, in New York State legal. And it seems to be a growing trend around the country. Uh, I forget, 36th or something in the country we are now uh, of states that are now allowing this. Yeah, quite a number have joined in, that's for sure. Our conversation continues in just a moment tonight. It's been more than a week since 95% of voters at the Syracuse Teachers Association said they have no confidence in the superintendent's ability to lead. Now there's a three-way conversation that's moving forward based out of City Hall. Welcome back to the talk tonight in the Syracuse City School District. Conversations continue between the superintendent, the teachers association and the mayor about ways to move forward following last week's no confidence vote in Superintendent Sharon Contreras. This is some video from last Thursday at the school board meeting. As you may remember, it was moved to a different location. Typically, these meetings are held at Syracuse City School headquarters on Harrison Street, but they were expecting such a large crowd that they moved it to a local school to allow for all of these people to come and speak. Uh, we continue our conversation here tonight. What do you think about what is going on in the Syracuse City School District and how it has been handled? It has been uh, certainly a controversial time, a one week cooling off period as it turned out before this meeting took place today at City Hall. And the mayor, uh, at the end of the day, ended up saying, well, you know, we put out a statement, we had a meeting. You know, and not only was she at the meeting, but also uh, Kevin Ahern from the Syracuse Teachers Association was there, and uh, several members of the school board were there, so they were all in on this conversation. And nobody who is inside the meeting is talking to people outside about what that conversation included. We certainly would like to know at least some general points about where the discussion is going. I mean, when you go from one week where the union is saying that, that the uh, superintendent should be out, taking the no confidence vote, issuing a very stern statement saying that the school board is abdicating its responsibility that the superintendent is inept and then there they are a week later uh, face to face sitting down that's progress certainly but you wonder well, what kind of conversation was it and so we reached out to all the parties involved here today the the district uh, we did not hear back from the superintendent's office uh, we also reached out to the mayor they told us that nothing would be released beyond their written statement we also reached out to every school board member uh, for the Syracuse City School District um, uh, probably about half of them responded by email saying sorry I don't have have anything to say or anything to offer here um, and so the, the the teachers association as well they said you know we're not going to release any information so well, we don't know we don't yeah, know what happened there. yeah and despite what the teachers association asked for last week they didn't truly expect that she was going to step down she's been clear she's not stepping down and that there's not a movement among the board to force superintendent Contreras to be out so so this process has to move on uh, over a longer term basis and then all sides need to kind of relearn how to work together to get something accomplished. And I think everybody like. probably would agree that it's sort of sad that it's come to this point, um, you know, where there are kind of mediators involved. We talked about how the mayor sort of has acted at the, as that mediator, invited everyone to her office to have this conversation today. Um, you know, but it sort of seems like it's gotten to the point where this hand couldn't talk to that hand and, and they really couldn't get along to come up with some sort of solution to all of these problems. So hopefully now, that there are some other outside people involved they can come up with something that might work. I mean, there is a lot of passion and intensity and we certainly hope that people are all caring about the uh, certainly about the students and their well-being. Uh, we did learn out of Albany this week that the governor has relaxed a couple more of those standards that were associated with the Common Core with regard to how teachers were being evaluated. Teachers had been raising concern for the last couple of years that they would be uh, assessed based on how their students perform on tests that they hadn't even seen yet, that hadn't been part of the curriculum yet. So that was relaxed by a couple of years again through this latest negotiation, which came very late uh, in the uh, legislative session, which wraps up today as they 
pull everything together in Albany right now. And you know, listen, we don't get the many opportunities to go inside of the Syracuse schools to sort of see what's happening. Um, and that, that sort of conversation developed as we were talking about this story over the last week. Teachers reaching out to us saying, listen, you know, you, you guys don't really know what's going on here and how difficult our jobs are, not just to teach these students, students but, um, you know, to maintain um, some, uh, you know. Yeah, the standards inside the, the school. The standards sure. inside the school. We, well, we certainly yeah. look forward to being inside those schools come the fall and finding out exactly what's going on. As always, we appreciate you joining us for the talk tonight. Posting your comments on Facebook and Twitter and the website, cnycentral.com, anytime. All right, let's head out to the weather deck now for a check on the forecast. First alert meteorologist Mike Brookins is in for Wayne tonight with a look at what you can expect as we head on into the weekend, Mike. Well, Matt and Megan, you guys have been tackling some tough subjects, but easy going weather wise for this evening and for the upcoming weekend. This is going to be about the fifth weekend in a row. Summarizing today, we had some high thin clouds, but readings were a little bit below average. There's the Stanley Law Sky Watch. Some high thin cloudiness with a system well out to our west. The high pressure to the north blocking any thicker clouds or precipitation. So we're looking nice to start this weekend. We only made the lower 70s at 72 for our high temperature in Syracuse for today. Typically, we're closer to 80 and we were at 50 last night. Pretty close to that again for tonight. Here's what we can expect as we go through the overnight. A partly cloudy sky at times mostly cloudy to variably cloudy. Other times mainly clear. Just those high thin clouds, the lower clouds should stay away from central New York and we should stay dry. It does turn quite cool though. We're going to be about 10 degrees below average by morning with a chance for some patchy valley fog. Sun and clouds for tomorrow. Pleasant day. It's brighter for Sunday. Lots of sun. A few clouds may mix in midday and then the afternoon, especially to the east. And it's also going to be warmer. So I'd say Sunday gets the nod of the better the two weekend days. Although overall, what a winning weather weekend we have here in central New York. Here's live triple Doppler radar. It is dry with just those high thin clouds and you can see the readings ranging from 73 down in Elmira to 61 up in Saranac Lake. There are the high clouds that are streaming in, thicker clouds over western New York that at times we may get, but this rain shield should stay on the other side of this red line. It may affect Jamestown, Williamsport, Pennsylvania towards State College, but in central New York, just getting the high clouds as that high pressure should keep all the precipitation at bay. So 77 for tomorrow, a little bit warmer, still below average. We get up closer to 80 with these warmer readings coming in as we get towards Sunday and they just keep going up. So enjoy the break from the heat and humidity as we start the summer season tomorrow at 651 because by Tuesday it is going to be awfully hot and humid. So your forecast for Saturday, if you're boating, northwest zero to 10 knots, the water temperature on Lake Ontario, very chilly on this big body of water at 58 degrees. With that light wind, we'll have wave heights a foot or less. Many areas of Oneida Lake, the North Shore should be calm or flat. We'll find up to one foot waves in the South Shore and the water temperature warmer at 68. Finger Lakes water temperatures close to 70. The UV index running high at an eight for Saturday and we'll find wave heights nearly flat, maybe up to a half a foot on some of the larger Finger Lakes. So for this evening, a blend of sun and clouds, then partly cloudy to variably cloudy. Winds will be dying off, so the temperatures falling into the 50s and eventually in some spots 40s. Some patchy light valley fog. Tomorrow, partly sunny to a mix of sun and clouds late in the day, a little bit brighter. First day of summer brings a high of 77 with low humidity. 80 degrees on Sunday. Sunday sunshine, there'll be a few clouds as we go into the uh, later afternoon, especially to the east. 85 on Monday with increasing clouds and isolated shower storm late. Few showers and storms on Tuesday, especially later in the day. And look at that. We've got that heat and humidity back at 89 and then scattered showers and storms coming up next Wednesday. There's your latest seven day forecast from outside. All right, Mike, thank you. We're still working on more stories for you. New at six tonight. Breaking news out of Ithaca, a tractor trailer carrying a load of cars. A lot of weight there coming down the hill on State Street off the Cornell East Hill has slammed into a popular restaurant, Simeon's and the Ithaca Commons. Here's the damage they're dealing with in Ithaca now for the last almost two hours. We're expecting an update from Ithaca police at the top of the hour. We know there are three people taken to the hospital. We know the driver of the tractor trailer has been taken into custody, not charged with anything, but Ithaca police have him in custody and are asking him questions. We'll have more from the mayor of Ithaca too, coming up as we continue. And take a look at this dramatic video into our newsroom tonight. A Syracuse man caught on tape starting a fire on the city's north side. We'll show you how it helped Syracuse police capture him.
Right now we're following breaking news out of Ithaca. A tractor trailer slammed into a popular restaurant, Simeon's, on the Comets. We're hearing multiple reports of injuries right now. Uh, people rushing to the restaurant to check on their loved ones. We've been following this story for you for the last hour. We'll continue to update you with late breaking details right now. Then an update on the legislation proposed after the horrific crimes of David Renz. It passed in the Senate, but now there's a hang up in Albany. We'll tell you what it will take for authorities to have access to sealed juvenile records when the suspect is accused of a sex crime. And take a look at this video. Watch what the man does here. Caught on tape, he starts a fire on the city's north side. We'll show you how it helps Syracuse police capture him. From CNY Central, this is NBC3 News at 6. Good evening, I'm Matt Mulcahy. I'm Megan Coleman. We continue to follow breaking news out of Ithaca tonight. We, we've just learned three people have now been hospitalized and the driver of a tractor trailer is in police custody. He has not been charged, but here's the latest. A tractor trailer slammed into a popular restaurant in the Ithaca Commons. And look at this new video just into our newsroom. This uh, vehicle right here just crashed right into the building. It, it looks like it tried to make the turn, I don't know. If anybody's been in Ithaca, driven down that hill before, you know that State Street Hill is pretty severe, and then it comes right into the commons, and as Griffin Carmichael is telling us via the Ithaca Voice, a digital website out of Ithaca, uh, this tractor trailer came right down that hill, lost control, and there's a lot of weight on any tractor trailer that's carrying a load of cars like that. Now, we talked just moments ago to the mayor of Ithaca, Savante Myrick. On days like this, um, you know, my job is a heavy one. Um, but I'll tell you, on days like this, you really, you, you appreciate, if you did before, what the fire department, what the police department, what the EMS, what all these first responders do for you. I mean, uh, their calm, their professionalism. This is my third year in office. I've had the privilege of watching them up close. I have to say that uh, uh, they, they show us the best in ourselves, and uh, they rise to the occasion. That is Ithaca Mayor Svante Myrick uh, just on the phone with us a few minutes ago. Now, to give you a sense of where this is, Simeon's is on the commons at State and Aurora Streets. Police say it could be some time, as long as 12 hours perhaps, before this area is reopened. Now, uh, via the Ithaca Voice on Twitter on this feed we're looking at right now, this is just a few minutes ago. Uh, people have been gathering around this scene uh, by the dozens. Some have been rushing up to Simeon's, screaming and crying and wondering if their loved one might have been inside that building. A very emotional scene, in fact. Uh, people saying that they've been seeing that type of scene. In fact, right after the crash, according again to the Ithaca Voice, people were going up to the building and breaking windows of Simeon's to get people out of there because there was concern concern about the stability of the building. All right, so again, the late breaking details, if you're just now joining us tonight, the breaking news out of Ithaca tonight, the Ithaca Commons, where a tractor trailer has slammed into Simeon's restaurant, actually pushed uh, inside the restaurant, three people taken to the hospital. The driver of the tractor trailer has now been taken into police custody for questioning. He has not been charged at this time. We're expecting a full update from the Ithaca police any minute now. We have a crew on the way to the scene and certainly will be following it on scene CNYCentral.com and all of our social media, including our CNY Central mobile app throughout the night, pushing out any late developments that we get. Well, switching gears tonight, a bill in Albany inspired by the terrible crimes of David Renz passed the Senate, but then didn't get through the assembly. This would have allowed authorities to have access to sealed juvenile records when the suspect is accused of a sex crime. Now tonight, we've learned this could pass next year, but it's tied to something else. New at 6 tonight, our Jim Kenyon shares perspective on the legislation supporters say would have stopped David Renz from raping a child and killing a beloved librarian from Liverpool. When David Renz murdered Lori Bresnahan and raped a 10-year-old girl last year, he had escaped from home confinement while awaiting trial on child pornography charges. It wasn't until after Renz's arrest that a woman contacted me to say that she had been sexually assaulted by Renz when he was a teen. 
the family court records of that prior sex crime had been sealed, even to county and federal prosecutors. Many now believe that if prosecutors had access to those family court records, Renz would never have been placed in home confinement and Bresnahan may be alive today. The idea behind sealing family court records is that a person shouldn't have to pay the consequences for the rest of his life for a youthful mistake. But a bill that passed the state Senate overwhelmingly this week would establish procedures to give authorities access to family court histories of defendants accused of sex crimes. The bill is the direct result of the case of David Renz, but it died in the state assembly. That comes as no surprise to Chief Assistant District Attorney Rick Trunfio. That's pretty typical for any pro-law enforcement or any sensible bill with regard to crime legislation. Uh, the Senate usually passes it overwhelmingly, bipartisanly, and then it stalls in the assembly. Trunfio says the family court access bill has broad support by law enforcement and will resurface next year. But he says it may become a bargaining chip as some lawmakers in Albany attempt to raise the age of criminal responsibility. Currently in New York, a criminal must be at least 16 years old before he or she can be charged as an adult. But some legislators want to raise that age of criminal responsibility to 18 years old. Our access to uh, juvenile records is important, particularly in light of the fact that there is a push in Albany to raise the level of uh, uh, juvenile offenders that we can prosecute as adults. And it makes absolutely no sense for us to raise the level of juvenile offenders and holding them accountable and not have access to their prior history. Trunfio says the State Association of District Attorneys will be meeting next month. He says the family court access bill, as it relates to the age of criminal responsibility, will become a priority issue. And proponents of raising the juvenile offender age to 18, including Governor Cuomo, point out that New York is only one of two states that prosecutes 16-year-olds as adults. Oh, Jim, this family court access bill, it mm -hmm. was sponsored by Assemblyman Al Sturpey. That's correct. What is he telling you tonight about why it died? Well, I talked to him uh, just a little while ago on the phone. He's back from Albany. He's in his home district. And uh, he's not at all pleased by what happened here. And he explained to me that there are a number of lawyers on the uh, Assembly Codes Committee, and they're just opposed to the idea of releasing confidential information of minors. He's, uh, he says, however, he's going to continue to work for passage of this bill. Yeah, we'll see if it may, might happen next year. Thank you, Jim. Moving now to an update on a story we've been following for you for some time. The state attorney general's office could be looking into whether the man investigators call Oswego County's most notorious sex offender should be confined to a secure psychiatric facility ahead of his scheduled release from prison next month. You saw it first on NBC3. We were first to tell you about the scheduled release of Ray Eunice. This man has been locked up for 16 years for sexually abusing 17 young boys in the Phoenix area during the 1990s. Police say there were even more victims, but because of the statute of limitations, Eunice escaped further prosecution. Well, we've been calling on this, trying to find an answer what will happen when he gets out. Now, the Attorney General's office says it can't comment, but the Oswego County DA says his office was recently contacted by the state attorney general about a previous conviction of Eunice from the 80s. We do know the Office of Mental Health is conducting an evaluation to decide whether Eunice continues to be a threat to the community should he be released as scheduled. Now based on that recommendation, the attorney general could take Eunice to court to have him committed to a secure facility for an indefinite period of time. On our website right now, cnycentral.com, you can read how the case of Ray Eunice has brought attention to changing the statute of limitations on sex crimes related to children. Well, all afternoon, we've been following developing news from the north side of Syracuse. A woman rescued from a fire on Butternut Street overnight Tuesday into Wednesday. She's in critical condition. And tonight, we've learned that fire was set on purpose. Police say it was set by a man with a history of starting fires. It was this video from a surveillance camera in the neighborhood that led police to arrest 56-year-old Patrick Kelly. Here, you can see him walking by the house. He lights something on fire, tosses it on the porch, and walks away. Our Alex Dunbar was there when the video was unveiled and joins us with new details live from the north side tonight. Alex. 
Well, Matt, investigators say this is right where the fire started in the early morning hours on Wednesday, right on the porch here at 931 Butternut Street. 56-year-old Patrick Kelly was charged with first-degree arson. Investigators say the key evidence they needed came from right across the street. We're going to show it to you as we zoom in. You can see a surveillance camera on the post over there, written right above it, police. And that is one of multiple surveillance cameras on Butternut Street here in Syracuse's north side. Police showed us the surveillance footage a little after 3 o'clock. You see someone walk up and throw a burning object onto the porch and then walk away very casually, occasionally stopping to look back. And within a few minutes, the house is engulfed in flames. Firefighters rescued a woman who lived here. She is still in critical condition. Patrick Kelly was charged with arson in the first degree. He has three other arson arrests in Syracuse dating back to 1973. Police and fire investigators say the surveillance footage from the crime cameras was instrumental and also exonerated two young men who walked by shortly after the fire started. Witnesses initially believed those two young men were involved. Syracuse Police Chief Frank Fowler says Kelly admitted to setting the fire after investigators told him about the surveillance footage. Was he interested? I don't believe he was interested, but uh, I, I think it, it did have an impact on uh, Mr. Kelly decided to be very forthcoming with us about his involvement in the crime. And also troubling what you see in the video, a lot of people driving by and walking by who did not call 911. And the investigators say they wish those, those calls had come in sooner. For now, reporting from Butternut Street on Syracuse's north side, I'm Alex Dunbar. Uh, just remarkable video there. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Alex. We appreciate that. Now, Patrick Kelly has spent time in New York State Prison on three occasions in the 1970s, the 80s, and the 90s. The first sentence was served for third-degree arson. That was in 1977. The second time, 1983, for attempted arson. Third time, 1993, again, for third-degree arson. Well, less than a mile and just blocks away, police are still trying to figure out what led up to a shooting in front of a home on Stu Ben Street late last night. Police say several people were drinking outside when gunshots were heard across the street. A man and a woman were hit. The man had emergency surgery for a wound to his abdomen. Both are expected to be okay. Police say two men were seen getting into a vehicle that left the scene, an SUV that was headed in the same direction. If you have any information that could be helpful, contact Syracuse Police right away. Still to come, we have a look at your weekend weather forecast. A nice day today, but does that continue? Heck, like now with the sky being partly cloudy, we're still... All is quiet right now. That's meteorologist Mike Brookins. He'll let us know what's on the horizon next. And we continue to follow breaking news out of Ithaca right now. Three people in the hospital, a tractor trailer loaded with cars it was transporting, came down a hill, slammed into Simeon's restaurant on the Comets. The damage is extensive. People were frightened, uh, running out of the building, breaking glass windows to get people out of the building. We have more on this coming up in a moment. Well, we continue to follow breaking news out of Ithaca tonight, a frightening situation on the commons. Tractor trailer apparently out of control, carrying a load of cars, came right down of what was likely coming down State Street. It could have been Aurora. We don't know yet all the full details, but ended up crashing into the corner uh, where the commons is there, right near that number one, that blue one you see, that building down there. And here's what that building looks like right at this hour. That's the crash scene. I mean, Megan, this was serious damage. People were inside Simeon's when it happened. Yeah, we do know. We do not know exactly how many people were inside, but we do know that uh, three people have been taken to the hospital. No word yet on the extent of their injuries. Uh, the tractor trailer driver is in police custody. They're questioning him about what happened here. No charges filed against him right now. Uh, certainly because of, of the scene right now, uh, they're urging people to stay away from that area. We want to give credit to the Ithaca Voice for their reporting on this, but Right now, the mayor and the police chief are talking to the media. When police and fire and EMS got on scene, we started what we refer to as working the scene. That basically just means that try to locate any victims, locate anybody that needs any sort of medical attention first. We can confirm there's been one casualty. From there, we uh, are in the process of trying to determine just exactly what occurred and why it occurred. The operator of the tractor uh, is in police uh, headquarters right now. We're in the process of interviewing him, trying to figure out again just exactly what occurred and how it occurred. There are mental health counselors in the area uh, down here at the scene so that uh, they can talk to folks, anybody that needs any sort of assistance or having any sort of grief 
uh, in regards to what they saw or what, if they were involved in the accident, they're able to assist them. Uh, four people were injured. There may have been a fifth one uh, that responded to a local hospital themselves, but we can't confirm that four people were injured and they were transported to a local hospital. Um, it's a tragedy, of course, what happened. Uh, we're asking that if anybody happened to see anything, if you were at one of the local restaurants, if you were walking in the area, please contact the Ithaca Police Department. We have our commercial motor vehicle, or excuse me, our commercial reconstruction team here, and as well as the New York State Commercial Motor Vehicle Reconstruction Team that's reconstructing what occurred. And uh, again, as soon as we are able to determine how and why the accident occurred, uh, we'll get that right out to you. But as it is right now, we're still just working the scene. We've evacuated uh, the 100 block of North Aurora and the 100, uh, 200 block of East State Street. As you can see the building behind us, uh, it, it's in horrible shape. Uh, the city engineer's office for the city of Ithaca and as well an outside engineering firm are on scene and they're going to evaluate the building and see if it needs to be completely evacuated and if so, for how long. Okay. Does anybody have any questions that I can help with? Are there you have an idea on the building? building? Pardon me? Are there still uh, we're evacuating the people that are left in there. To our knowledge, there's not anybody, but there are some apartments we haven't been able to get into or have been unable to get into, so we'll make a determination, uh, you know, if we need to force entry or anything like that at a later date, but anybody that was in harm's way is certainly out of the building now. Any timeline for how long this might stay here? Uh, the building itself is going to be uh, shut down for the foreseeable future. Uh, we, we advise, advise folks to stay away, uh, avoid the scene, even on your morning commute tomorrow. So we don't know how long it'll take, but if you're planning ahead, plan uh, to take a detour around the east end of the commons. Absolutely. Is there any risk of the building collapsing? Yeah, I'll take that. Sure, sure. go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm Savante, I'm the mayor. There is some risk of the building collapsing. We did bring in a crane. Uh, we have our building inspectors on the scene. They are going to tell us what we need to do to the building to keep it stable. It, we want to save the building if we can. Um, it's beautiful and it's historic, but safety is our number one priority right now. So if we feel that the building is going to collapse, we will take it down ourselves. Are tractor trailers allowed on the street? I know a few years back on Aurora Street there was a horrible accident. Uh, they are allowed. It's a state highway. Uh, so we get quite a lot of tractor trailer traffic coming down 79. Or, or building a barrier or something um, to stop more, you know? I think it's a good, it's a good question. It's a question we're going to have to ask ourselves. And uh, we do have bollards uh, on the commons that would stop something like this. But with a tractor trailer this large with two decks of cars, um, it's a question we have to ask ourselves once the work is finished here today. Do you have an idea on the victim? Uh, we can't release that yet, pending notification of the family. On the four taken to the hospital, that does not include the fatal? It does not include the fatality. How severe are those injuries? Uh, you know, we never really comment on the severity of the injuries. Um, I can tell you that they're not life-threatening. Um, they uh, were superficial in nature, but again, you know, the specific severity, we don't really go into too many details. It's private information, merely for those folks. Where's the driver? The operator of the vehicle. Uh, he's cooperating with police, and uh, he's in uh, police headquarters. You know, we're interviewing him again in regards to what occurred and how and why it occurred. Uh, but again, most importantly, uh, he's okay, and uh, he's cooperating with police. So, uh, you know, that's that's something great to focus on. Where's the driver from on the truck? Pardon me? Where are the truck and the driver from? I don't know, to be honest with you, sorry. And can you tell us the fatality? Was it a worker or a, a, or a diner? Uh, we're still going through the process, uh, you know, in, in regards to you're kind of reconstructing where everybody was and uh, you know what their role is or their purpose was inside of the restaurant and outside of the restaurant we also know that you know people scattered from uh, from the front of the restaurant uh, on the sidewalk too so we're still in the process of gathering all of our information and then we'll make a determination uh, after uh, after we've evaluated everything we'll make a determination uh, you know on on who was where and uh, and what happened during the accident and uh, bring it forward right after so are the people seated outside when this happened uh, there were people uh, on the sidewalk, but I don't think there were anybody uh, seated uh, in the 100 block of uh, North Aurora or 200 East State. There were construction workers yeah, within feet of the, the vehicle, so they were just able to escape injury. Can you confirm reports that people rushed towards Simmons to help out? I uh, can't confirm reports, but I've been hearing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I was, I think, the second uh, police car on scene. And, uh, it was a, a great community effort. You know, that's one of the beautiful things about Ithaca is folks coming together. 
and uh, you know during times of uh, of grief, times of emergency, uh, you know, any time where there's somebody uh, that needs help, Ithaca is first and foremost in line to help that person. And that happened here. Folks uh, right in the immediate area were running over to help out. Uh, they were helping police officers, helping fire and EMS, and that's uh, that's amazing. Any alcohol, any drugs with the driver? Any What's that, sir? Of alcohol and drugs with the driver? Uh, not at this point, okay. you know, again, but it's too preliminary. Uh, it's too early to tell on that type of stuff. Well, we learned a lot there from uh, Mayor Sponte Myrick and uh, Officer uh, Williamson yeah. from the Ithaca Police Force. Several people injured. One person was killed in this crash here. Yeah, uh, they are calling it a tragedy what happened there. They have evacuated uh, several uh, areas around there. The 100 block of Aurora Street, the 200 block of State Street. City engineers are on the scene right now because uh, that building is uh, considered unstable. They're going to monitor that and see if they need to do any further evacuations in that building. Yeah, it's, it has been a landmark of Ithaca for generations now. And then we did learn one other bit. Uh, that that the truck did come down Route 79 off the East Hill on State Street right into the Commons onto uh, hitting Simeon's. It was about 4 o'clock this afternoon. We're going to get you all the latest details throughout the night, pushing it out to you on our CNY Central mobile app with the very latest information. Also, complete coverage with our reporter Alex Rosilla, who's down there. He'll be there on NBC3 News at 11. We'll be back with more. Welcome back. We've got some great news for the weekend. High pressure is going to hold on right now. Overhead, we've got a mixture of sun and clouds, low humidity, dew point temperatures in the 40s and